and I'm going to talk about guided growth in the sagittal plane. So um, there are not too many indications for the hip. Um, I've never seen it used in the hip, but there are some procravatum conditions that we see around the hip. They're mostly related to soft bone, um, but there might be a way of improving that. Um, uh, it's very effective for knee flexion deformities and can be effective for ankle procravatum. So here's the child. She's four years old, and you can see she has bilateral knee flexion deformities. And here she is at four and a half, no previous surgery. She walks with long leg braces and crutches at home. And she had a flexion deformity of about 45 degrees. We're only looking at the right here. So here's the anterior eight plates. And here you can see a year and a bit afterwards, look at the change in the physeal orientation compared to the long axis of the femur. And here's the child um, uh, three years afterwards, and you can see that the plate is bending. Very powerful systems. This has been looked at in the past, um, mostly in the neuromuscular um, children. Um, you can see the authors there. Uh, the indications were somewhere around a 10 degree deformity and significant growth remaining. The mean correction from these studies is around 15 degrees, and the best was with the uh, tension band plate. Um, and something that we've noticed is that the, fice, the degree of physeal reorientation doesn't necessarily correlate with the improvement in the knee flexion uh, deformity. And here's the child at removal at age eight. You can see there was a broken screw, um, but it was a good correction. Disappeared, came back at 13 years of age with this significant flexion deformity. I don't think there's enough growth um, uh, opportunity to realign this, but look at the orientation of the physis, almost perpendicular to the long axis. They, for some reason, growth plates always try and seek that perpendicular position at the end of the long bones. There's something... There's an there's a, uh, inherent driver there. Um, and so an extension osteotomy and short leg ventral lengthening and, um, and then at removal of all the implants with a flexion deformity five degrees. Um, look at where that screw ended up. Look how much growth there was there. Here's another child with arthrogryposis with a um, a milder uh, knee flexion deformity, and a different technique. This is a modification of the metazo technique, and um, you can see that these, you know, it's relatively easy to put in, um, but you want to get them a little more anterior than this. And Peter suggested maybe using an arthrogram to make sure that you aren't in the joint. So here's the um, correction, um, and you can see that she's had a reasonable correction, and it's still ongoing. This child has knee dysplasia, um, hip flexion contractures, knee flexion contractures, and very, very characteristic in knees, the flat feet. And she also has a very stiff back. Notice if it was a child with a flexible back, they'd walk erect, wouldn't they, with a big lordosis. And she doesn't have a lordosis because she doesn't have the flexibility in her low back. And so if you're going to fix her knee flexion contracture, you also have to plan what you're going to do about the hip flexion contracture. Okay, And you can think about that while I'm talking. What I've seen the most common thing is the knee flexion contractures, as you get them better, the hips look better, usually, um, but not always. So here she is, um, bilateral uh, flexion contractures. Um, and then patella baja, just look at that, and it, it might have an impact on what, what happened here. So um, this child um, had anterior eight plates. And you can see nice correction, 
Nice spreading of the screws. Left side, better correction than the right. Here she is a year after the insertion of the eight plates, and you can see basically a straight knee on the left, not quite straight on the right, but she was having a lot of pain um, uh, over those eight plates on the right. And it was a lot of crepitus, um, constant discomfort. And so, um, although it wasn't completed, we removed those, um, the, those plates. I've seen that and I've heard other people talk about it. I don't know why it occurs. Um, Peter wondered whether it was because of the Baja and maybe the, um, the distal quadriceps tendon flipping over it. Um, uh, maybe during the approach to the, um, uh, uh, to the medial side, there was damage to the restraining structures for the extensor mechanism medially, and there's a little more drift back and forth. I don't know what, but um, I think um, uh, this does occur. Um, and so uh, we removed the plates. She still had significant hip flexion contractures, so we went on to do hip extension osteotomies. And then you can see we also used the plate to realign the left distal femur. Um, this is a child with recessive multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. There are many different types of multiple epiphyseal dysplasia. There's nine or 10 that I know of. The geneticists probably have more. And they're caused by, it's caused by all sorts of genetic problems. And um, uh, this one is a very, very specific one and it's called a recessive MED, and it's the same gene that causes diastrophic dysplasia. It's a sulfate transport gene. And so look at this patella. What's with that patella? It's a double layer, right? Double layer patella. And that is pathognomonic of this form of MED. So if you see it, make you think about something else going on. Um, and so this technique was described by Ken Noonan. Um, he, um, um, uh, I don't know whether he still uses this technique. I've only used it once. Um, but it was designed to put the guide wire in from proximal to distal antigrade. I put it in retrograde, um, and it worked pretty well through the articular surface. And um, I, I got a little correction um, over a number of years. Um, it was finally taken out because uh, she had discomfort right over the screw here. And um, I think Dr. Stevens has heard the same story from other people. And then this is the lateral. Unfortunately, it's not a perfect lateral. It's a CT reconstruction. But you can see we got the knee reasonably straight. She's actually gone on to a total hip replacement on the left. Diastrophic dysplasia, the worst foot deformities that I deal with, that's for sure. Um, and, um, you know, diastrophic dysplasia, or the cauliflower ears, and the hitchhiker thumb, right? Well, think of hitchhiker big toe. Some of them have it very severely. Um, this child has had multiple soft tissue releases and had a very stiff marked equinus. Um, this is not that child, but this is, uh, we tried to, um, on a few of these kids, to get correction of the Aquinas by doing an anterior eight plate of the ankle, and I think it's far too much. There's far too little growth potential and far too much deformity to expect it to work. Um, I'm, I'm, doing re I'm doing realignment osteotomies on these, and, and just to show you how, how far you have to translate this distal fragment posteriorly. Um, this tibia is sitting on the anterior surface of the distal fragment. The cut surface is back here. So you've got to get, you want to get the tibia over the talus if you can. And then an easier way to doing it, but not so easy for the patient, is to use a gradual technique I used in the Lizeroff technique here to um, um, do a gradual correction. Thank you.